Hello, lovely to be here. Uh, a warm welcome to everybody for what I know will be a really interesting session. We are privileged to have with us the former Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern, who was one of the architects of the Good Friday Agreement and one of the signatories on that day in April 1998. And joining us also is the Minister for Peace Building from the Republic of South Sudan, Stephen Parr Kowal. South Sudan, as you may know, is the world's youngest country, born in 2011, then beset by civil war in December 2013. A peace deal was signed in 2018 and is now in the process of being implemented. So I'd like to invite them both to join me now and uh, we'll begin our discussion. Nice to see you again, Mr. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Bertie. Do you want to have a seat here? Great. I'll get straight to it because we're under a tight schedule. Uh, Bertie, if I could start with you, what specific elements of the Good Friday Agreement do you think contributed most to its success? And what's the takeaway for other countries and other conflicts? Well, the fact that we were able to bring parties from all sides. I were able to take loyalists and unionists, nationalists, republicans, um, who had all been involved in the, in the conflict in one form or another, some constitutional parties, some, some been involved in and associated with those involved in paramilitary violence. But to, to be able to get an agreement that seemed like a win-win for everybody, uh, that it seemed like fair and balanced, um, plenty of issues to argue about, but it, Tony Blair and I at the time said the only way to do this was to try and bring everybody in, bring the main parties in, bring the extremes in, and try and make it as comprehensive as possible uh, and not dodge too many issues. Some of them took time, but uh, to, to try and make sure that the, the range of issues covered the agendas of everybody. And I think that was the, uh, the world or the attempts, uh, as you, you know, or led over the years. Um, 74, 85, um, so in the 30 years there was only three real attempts. But I think the difference was in 98, uh, once we got peace, and it wasn't a perfect peace as with the video said, but at least then you could pull everybody in. And, and the fact everybody was in, I think, was if you left somebody out, too many out, uh, it wasn't going to work. So I think that was the main thing. And, and I think that is the lesson for, for other conflicts. Uh, that you, you, you have to try and have a, a broad agenda, try to deal with the issues that cause the conflict, uh, not just try to deal with some people's issues. Um, and if, if that's not easy always, constitutional parties have difficulties in, in dealing with that. But if you want to make progress, my view, my view, and I know it's a beautiful view in some places, but you have to be uh, inclusive and comprehensive. Thank you. So everybody in from the beginning, Minister, if I could turn to you, South Sudan has its own peace process. The agreement was signed in 2018. Do you think there are lessons from the Good Friday Agreement that are applicable for you? And equally, are there lessons from South Sudan that you think can be valuable elsewhere? Yes. Um, first of all, historically, uh, with Ireland, we shared British colonial history. We were colonized by British. We had our conflicts with in the Sudan. Personally, I was a diplomat of the United Sudan until 2010. And the conflict between the North and the South was very similar with the sectarian conflict that you had here. Because the British colonial rules, the Anglo-Egyptian condominium rules, divided the country of the Sudan culturally and religiously, then put it together hastily at the end of World War II, and the conflict raged between the two parts of the country. Today, with the culture of war that we inherited from that conflict, we had our own war in 2013. And if you look at the similarities between Good Friday and the agreements, uh, which is 
in this book we call uh, the Alliance Agreement on Conflict Resolution in South Sudan is quite similar. But could I interrupt, Minister, and just ask you, how would you assess the state of the peace process, of the implementation of that agreement? The UN has been quite critical of the delays and has said the peace process can't implement itself. How is the implementation going? Well, it is turbulent, has the talks itself, and um, I wrote a book which I call War Talks. I think the War Talks, which produced these agreements, continued in the transitions. And I'm part of that government of national unity as a cabinet minister now. Uh, the dialogue continue and the implementation is difficult. Uh, we all come from this background. You have seen it, uh, the implementation of uh, Good Friday Agreement was not also easy here. And because of the entrenched attitude of war and conflict, that always goes on. A question for both of you. In terms of approach and tactics in negotiation, I mean, we know that the late Mo Molum, who was the Northern Ireland Secretary and who was undergoing chemotherapy at the time, would occasionally take off her wig at tense moments in negotiations. But everybody doesn't have a Mo Molum or a Senator George Mitchell. Bertie, do you think there are any approaches used here that can be adopted elsewhere? Um, again, this one is a bit controversial, but, but I think in, in terms of the Irish peace process, and I think a lot of other ones as well, external involvement is essential. Um, because if, if, if a conflict is drifting on, and there's lots of conflicts in the world that have been drifting on, there's frozen conflicts, and if, if you don't have somebody who uh, can be an honest broker, somebody who can um, not be involved in the day-to-day, -day, that didn't have family roots one side or the other, uh, they can bring an awful lot to it. So I think international mediators uh, are a very good thing, uh, because George Mitchell, in our case, um, he had family ties, but there weren't ties that were of, of recent origin. And he, he was tremendous. I mean, he, he, he was able to chair, he was able to be friendly to people, he was able to pull sides together, um, be able to talk to the governments, give out to the governments, you know, so, and I think you, you, you do need that kind of a, an international image. And the conflicts that I've been involved in in different places, it's the same, it's the same thing, it, it, it helps. There are some countries that feel no outside influence, you know, don't need the help, don't need anything. But if you examine them, they seem to be still going on. Uh, so uh, I think that's the, the, the biggest thing. It's that being able to be big enough to be able to say we need help. Um, and in, in, in our case in Ireland, uh, when President Clinton gave us somebody of the calibre and the standing of George Mitchell, it, it was something to change the dynamics. Stephen, what would you say? Well, very similar. Um, in our context, in South Sudan conflicts, without external intervention, we were not going anywhere. In fact, the first version of the agreement we signed in 2015 was an imposed agreement by external forces, the regions of Igat, and with the support of the Troika. And the international community at large forced us literally to sign an agreement. So external pressures help, but implementation of the agreement always takes the parties that sign the agreement for it to realize. In our case, the talks broke down so many times, and even the agreement that we signed in July 2015 did not last long. It also collapsed. And again, it took external uh, support, external initiatives um, led by EGOT in 2017, 2018. We signed this version we call the Vitalized Peace Agreement, which put together the government of the day in Juba, the Artigono. Is it revitalized? Well, I th it is revitalized. The, the question is whether attitudes have been revitalized or not. Because 
it is difficult to change attitudes. W will you have elections next year, do you think? You're due to have them by December 2024, but it's slipped a bit a few times. Well, that is what the uh, time frames, which we call uh, the roadmaps, says, and that is the stipulation in the agreement. But the condition for elections uh, are not there, as we speak. That we sounds like a no. The condition are not there. <laughs> because it, it, it will need a reunification of the armed forces that have been fighting each other. You need a new constitution, which we call permanent constitution in chapter six of this agreement. You also need peace dissemination to the grassroots and to our people in diaspora because our nation is polarized. You need to unify all the ranks and files of all the formerly foes for you even to talk about elections. You're both veterans of, of peace processes, which as we can see, have some similarities. Uh, now, none of us like to admit our mistakes and perhaps neither of you made any, but looking back, is there anything you feel you should have done differently? I think plenty of things. I, you, you know, you, you, try, you try to set out an agreement that was as comprehensive as a Good Friday Agreement and you try to include everything in it. Um, uh, and you, so, some of them go fall back in time. Uh, if you could do them all far quicker, um, it would be better because in, in our case, we were trying to we were cha change the criminal justice system, change in the constitution in the Republic of Ireland, um, reforming policing, uh, which was one of the big successes at the time. And you know, try, trying to um, deal with legacy issues and the reality is that 25 years on, uh, we're still trying to deal with some of those issues, so we didn't, we didn't get those as, as right as, as we'd want to. Uh, dealing with the putting arms beyond use worked fairly well, but getting rid of arms didn't work so well. So, um, and, and I suppose in, in, the, in the politics of it, we, there is a review clause in the, in the Good Friday Agreement, which is a good idea in an agreement. It's only been triggered once. Uh, I think there's a, a demand now by numerous parties about different issues that that review should be um, looked at again, probably after the restoration of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. So um, it, it, anyone I think that says an agreement is perfect is, is probably suffering an delusionary <laughs> tactics, but I, I think you, 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 you have to keep monitoring it. Every year I think you have to keep watching and, and in fairness to all the parties who negotiated it, they all acted in good faith. Um, they all did their very best, but that doesn't mean that collectively there are things that you know, we should have done better and still can do better, and that, that's my view. Can I turn to you, anything that you would look back and say you would have done differently or others should have done differently in the peace process in South Sudan? Well, um, uh, conflict resolution is not easy. It, it takes leadership and courage uh, to move uh, the process forward. Um, Ireland was put on the map of the world by the violence that you have seen there. And, and, and conflicts also create culture of war. It, it creates its own culture, culture of violence and all this. So a changing mind, because conflict is a mindset. Uh, conflict is starting in the mind, it has to end there, not on papers uh, that are being signed. So it is always difficult. But it do you, needs do you see progress in changing the mindset? Because it feels like it's a little bit stuck. Well, we are building trust. And um, conflict resolution need creation of new relationships. Um, the first agreement we signed in 2015 did not last long because the relationships were still hard. Uh, today, we are making progress along that line. Trust building is ongoing. But honestly, it's not simple because it is easy to destroy it. But peace building, the, 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 the building of the reconstruction of the social public of the society that has been devastated by conflict for over nine years now, is not easy. I have a last quick question for you both because to my great regret, we're, we'll soon be running out of time. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. But Stephen, if I could ask you, when will we have elections in South Sudan? 
Well, um, I cannot predict it. I have already told you that it is not about the elections. It is about the country to govern beyond elections. And uh, in my current docket as a Minister of Peace Building, the strategic objective and the strategic vision should be building a sustainable peace. It should not be about, you know, um, obtaining, uh, you know, holding a sham elections where someone obtains a, a checky legitimacy. That sounds like call it. that sounds like not soon. Uh, not soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bertie, I have a nice easy one for you. Uh, when will the Stormont Assembly be up and running again? Uh, um, does that say they're in favour or against? But anyway, I, 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 um, I would be very disappointed if it's not by the end of next month. I, I, I think that we, do, we have an opportunity now uh, and I think if that opportunity isn't taken, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not, there's no point in putting pressure on anybody because we realise that never gets anywhere. But if it's not by the end of November, um, we, we drift into a position where it's election year all over the place, uh, and I, I think life will become far more difficult. The, the opportunity is there, it's been there all year. I, I would have liked to have been able to say to you today, it's already up and running. But I, I think leaving it drift beyond the end of next month will be, in my view, a terrible mistake. Do you see anything that gives you hope? That, that, that the yeah, government? yeah. There's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of work, a lot of efforts, a, a, a lot of people are working hard on it, and um, uh, you know, it, it won't be easy. It won't be without it won't be without some some difficult decisions. Um, but if those difficult decisions are not taken, like the all the leaders that I had the honour of working with, all the party leaders and, and the people that I worked with 25 years ago, they all had to go to their own people and convince their own people that this was the right thing to do, that this was an inclusive, comprehensive agreement and that they were prepared to put their name to it and prepared to work to make it happen. Um, and we're in the same boat today. And if we allow this, if we allow this period pass, um, my feeling is we'll regret it deeply. I'd like to thank you both for sharing your memories and your expertise. It's extraordinary to hear from people who've been involved firsthand in the very long, hard business of peacemaking. It's been fascinating for me. I'm sure it's been fascinating for everyone in the hall. Thank you, thank very, you very much, much indeed. Thank Thanks, Bertie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you both very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.